Okay, what's up everyone? Tweak here, representing Fab Equestria, home of the Military Brony. And I'm very honored to be joined by one of the writers for My Little Pony Friendship is Magic, M.A. Larson. Hello. M.A., thank you very much for showing up. Thanks for having me. Taking the time for us here. Yeah, cool. Okay, we'll get started. Uh, something I want to ask you. We'll start off with, tell us, tell the viewers something that they don't know about you. Something you've, you know, your deepest, darkest <laughs> secret. <laughs> the deepest, darkest secret. Uh, I don't really have any of those. Okay. I guess um, something that might be kind of cool is... Uh, before I moved to LA and started working on these anime, animated shows, I did a, I wrote a screenplay for the Green Hornet. Oh, uh, really? Yeah, the, 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 that Kevin Smith was going to produce. Uh, and then the whole project went away. It was for Miramax, and Miramax went bust. And, oh, wow. Well, they didn't go bust, but it got bought by Disney, and the, it all just fell apart. So, so we possibly could have had a good Green Hornet. <laughs> it could have happened. Yeah, all right. it could have happened. <laughs> and it didn't. All right, so um, how many different kinds of cons, conventions have you been to? And following up on that, have you noticed a difference between normal anime conventions and the brony conventions? <clears throat> uh, I don't have much experience. This is my third pony convention, and I've been to Comic-Con twice, and um, that's it. And differences? I mean, it's interesting to have it all be centered around, you know, one thing. <laughs> right. It's pretty cool. And to have worked on it is amazingly cool. The Comic Con is, uh, for me, it was almost too much. It's like it's hard to walk through the the hall because it's so jam packed with people. Right. Um, it's cool to see all the different things and whatnot, but um, I, I, like after about an hour, I was like, okay, okay I'm <laughs> go home, take a break. Now. Yeah, these are more fun. It's, you know, everybody here has the same reason for being here. Right. Now, when you went to Comic Con, were you there? Because of My Little Pony, or were you there for representing no. some other shows? I haven't been in probably three years. Oh, okay. And I wasn't even really representing anything. I was just... The first time I went, a buddy of mine had a table, and he's an artist. And he's like, you want to go? And I said, sure, I'll go. So, so, so were you there on like on panels like you are here, nope. or you were just kind of nope. floating around? Just floating around. The first panels I've ever done were for pony conventions. Oh, okay. Was, it, was it a bit, a bit nerve-wracking? Because traditionally... The writers for shows don't get as much love as city actors. <laughs> right. Like, so was it a little harrowing for that? It was, it was, it's, yeah, I mean, I have horrible stage fright anyways, <laughs> and I hate talking in front of crowds and public speaking. So the first time I did it, it was at a, a really small convention called Midwest Street Chicago, which was great, because it was, it was sort of intimate, and by the end of the weekend, I knew every face, and I, was, I recognized everybody. So to do the panel there was a little bit of a friendly environment. Um, and now I'm a little bit used to it, and it's also, you just sit down and you're like, all I'm doing is talking about this show that I really enjoy working on, so right. no stress. Not gonna be that difficult. Right. Yeah, so I like it, man, it's fun. Okay, well I'm, I'm glad, as if you weren't having fun, then we'd all <laughs> feel very, very bad for making you come here and pestering you with questions. I will say, the first time I sit down at any panel, this is true yesterday, I'm sure it'll be true today, for about five minutes, I'm just like petrified. <laughs> like, I don't wanna be up here right now, but then, answer a question, and then it's, oh yeah, this is fun, this is cool. All right, now... Uh, <laughs> a little bit of terror. Right, exactly, well, a little bit of terror always makes it interesting. Now, I'm sure there are people running around with the assumption that writing for My Little Pony or writing for TV <clears throat> is the greatest job ever, and it's nothing but sunshines, rainbows, and gumdrops. What would you do to dispel that? What are the most stressful parts of your job? Okay, this is really boring, I'm sure, but it's true, and it's, it's money, and it's... It's really scary to work in TV animation because there's only a handful of staff jobs. I've, I, I was lucky to get one for my very first job, and I've had two in the entire, what, eight years I've been in animation, I've had two staff jobs. Everything else is freelance. So all you're doing is worrying, what am I gonna do after this? This is great, I got the job, and immediately you're worrying, what am I gonna do next? How am I gonna keep the job? Exactly, <laughs> even if you get a staff job, you got maybe six months before you have to start freaking out again. And what am I going to go to next? And you know, it's the hub for me was such a godsend because it opened up a whole new set of shows to work on. I've worked on I think four shows over there, um, so it's it's that. As there are really hard realities about the money aspect of it. You know, we don't get we're not in the writers guild. We're in the thing called the animation guild. Oh, okay. So we don't get residuals, which is what a, a primetime writer would get every time. Say I wrote Modern Family. Every time it airs, you get money. We don't get that. 
we get a one-time check and that's it. Oh. So My Little Pony can air a million times and I don't get a penny for it. The voice actors do and the musicians do. That's just the quirk of our union. Just the nature of the beast, how yeah. it works. So you have to really always be looking for the next thing. You can't, you can't rely on, oh, I wrote a really successful show, now money's gonna come in. It doesn't. Oh, okay. So it's the scrap. You're always scrambling. <laughs> so, so it's actually like a job. Yes. Yeah. It's a, it's a. Your job is like looking for the next job, basically, and then writing in the meantime. Right. <laughs> okay. Uh, speaking of writing, um, I know almost every author has had to deal with the horrible beast that is writer's block. Have you ever experienced that writing for My Little Pony? And would you have any tips to help aspiring authors how to get over that? That's such a good question. It's a. Uh, I didn't believe in it until last year when I got it. Uh, <laughs> I've never had it on my little pony because uh, the show is so structured, it's all laid out, and we don't really have to worry about that. Poof! Magically, we have reappeared in another room. We should so, just keep doing this. I know, right? Just and every question, pow! New room. <laughs> okay, so continue on where we were. We're asking we're about, about writer's block. Writer's block. And Perfectly enough. Uh, anyhow, it's. I didn't believe it until last year when I got it. I've never had it on My Little Pony because the show is so um, structured. You know, we, we sit in a room and break it all out. You know exactly what you're doing when you go home to write. Um, but it was, uh, it, was, it was such a weird sensation because I was like, I would spend an entire day writing, end up with two pages of just gar garbage, just crap. <laughs> and I knew it and it was just a struggle and I kept rewriting and it was awful. And, and I was like, and finally I was like, oh my god, this is right for block, I actually have it. <laughs> and there's really nothing you can do but just keep going. And eventually it stopped and, you know, you move on. I, I, I've heard an old quote that said, the, the, don't be afraid to write badly. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's one of the best things I've learned writing for TV animation is the first draft is always awful. No matter what, it's bad. Then you go back and you turn it into a real first draft. So you just have to accept that and not be scared of that. And like, yes, I'm writing garbage, and I always do, and that's cool. And I'll go back and try to make it better. Uh, M.L. Larson, if he writes garbage, it's wow. It's true. We're here first, folks. Everything I've ever written started as garbage, just awful writing. It's true. Maybe it ended up that way, too. I don't know. <laughs> it started that way, for sure. But I, there, there's a, a Hemingway quote that I read the other day, actually. And he said, when you have writer's block, uh, the, the way to get through it is to write one perfect sentence. He said a pure sentence or something like that. Yeah. And just focus on that sentence until it's absolutely like pristine. And then you can go on from there. Oh. That, was, that was his uh, his take on it. I think I also heard Hemingway once say, uh, write drunk, edit sober. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yes, that's right. Okay, so given what we are, Fob Equestria, we're wondering, do you have any experience with you or with your family about the military? Any members of your family um, in it? Or? Nobody in my immediate family, uh, but I have a... I have just a slew of uh, uncle, my grandfather's in World War II, a bunch of my uncles were in Vietnam and Korea. Um, so I have a lot of my extended family is or was in the military. Okay. Um, I, I have huge, I love our military. I'm just a huge background in the military. Well, thank you. Did it surprise you to learn that there are, is a big community of military bronies out there? Yeah, yeah, I, yeah, it did. It's, it's, this, this community is just filled with like surprises, you know? <laughs> First of all, that, it, it, that any of this exists at all for the show. Exactly. And then that there's like a military contingent. It's it surprised you that downstairs there's a big beefy infantryman dressed as Big Macintosh, <laughs> and there's a drill sergeant walking around with a pink pony on his shoulder. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's surprising. Yeah. Well, can I ask you something? Actually? Absolutely. Absolutely. How? Like, you guys all weren't in the same. You're not all from the same place. No, right? no. Like, I'm in the army. Uh, Mish is the Marine Corps. We have airmen. We have around the country. Men. Yes. So how, how did you all... Well, it also, Mish there actually started the whole thing off when he was at BronyCon last year at that luncheon. Okay. He linked up with our site heads, uh, King Harold and Saunterhoof. Josh. Uh, Josh Scorcher. <laughs> and they just got together and said, hey, we need to do some sort of website for the military bronies. Right. And it just kind of blew and exploded. And I found it, and I went there begging and pleading, please let me help in some way. <laughs> in your individual experiences, were there other people around you who were into the show, or was it strictly on the internet? Uh, no, I'd say they're everywhere, and you, you get surprises. Uh, I've had a couple of different privates that come to my basic training company that end up being bronies, and of course, so funny. of course I can't walk up and be like, hey, bro, a private, but, you know, <laughs> they're there. They how, do you, how do you make that known? Like, how do you, uh, 
Sometimes it just happens. And do you think I can have time to tell him the private flourish story? Oh, definitely. Okay. Always time for the private flourish. Right, private flourish. We were uh, standing outside of the chow hall. They're in formation, and the privates they go in ten at a time, and they sound off one drill sergeant, two drill sergeant, three drill sergeant. Right. And always loud. Everything in basic training is always loud. Right. Well, this one kid decided he wanted to be nice and quiet, so he comes up and goes, seven drill sergeant. I said, whoa, 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 hold up right there, Private. Why don't you grab your boy bits and try that one again? Louder. Seven drills hard. Louder. Seven drills hard. Louder. And as I live and breathe, dude looked at his battle buddy, looks back at me and goes, <gasps> And wow. I just kind of stared at him that a minute because it, it broke my brain a little bit. And then I swear, he looks at me and goes, too loud, drill sergeant. <laughs> And I said, you are my favorite private in the history of ever. Now get over there and beat your face till the stupid dies. <laughs> That's unbelievable. Yep. That's amazing. It, that, that, that actually happened. <laughs> and for the rest of the cycle, he was Private Fluttershy. That is absolutely fantastic. So what would have happened to him if it wasn't you, if it was some other guy? Probably, someone probably would have just said, what, what the <laughs> expletive is wrong with you? Go away. That's amazing. That's really incredible. We are everywhere. Yeah, no kidding. <laughs> All right, uh, moving on. Uh, aside from different TV shows you've written for, do you have any other writing experiences? Plays, novels, anything like that? I've never written a play. Um, I actually wrote a book. Yeah, that's what I was talking about with the um, Writer's Block. I was working on this book. I sold it. It's coming out next May. Oh, really? Yeah. And um, Can we ask what it's about? Absolutely. I think you guys would love it. It's, I sold it originally in 2006 to Disney as a TV series, and it didn't go anywhere, so I got all the rights back wrote it as a book and kind of made it older, so it's more like for the Harry Potter, it's sort of that. Sort of like the, the, the teen tween age. Yeah, it's not quite why it's not Twilight, it's not like that, but it's also... Thank you. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, but the idea is like it's a Grimm's fairy tale world, and witches have started to take over a little bit, and princesses are the only thing that can defeat a witch. So it's a battle, it's a battle between witches, and it's, oh. and it's the story is about, a, it was originally called Princess Boot Camp, these girls go to this camp where they learn to become princesses through these like various military style activities. There's a character who's called the Fairy Drill Sergeant. Uh, so she's I'm, like this big and she shouts at the, all of them, you know, do this, do Yes, that. yes, this is, <laughs> I haven't read it, this is my favorite book ever. I'm gonna pre, pre, pre order it right now. In fact, you know what, can you just give me one second while I get on? It doesn't have a title, I wish I could tell you the title, but I don't have a title yet, so I'm still working on that. But, uh, and then I sold it as a movie, so I'm writing the screenplay for the movie now. Yes. So. <laughs> It, and it's, we know when that the book or anything's going to come out. The book comes out next May. Next May. The movie, who knows, it may never come out. Hopefully, okay. it will. But. Yeah, I'm. I'm. You're going to have the entire weight of the United States military brony community behind you, and we're out there, so we're, <laughs> we're going to help you out. It's a series, so it's the first book comes out next May. The second one is the following May. I haven't written that one yet, but that's the idea. Is it's a war, and these girls, and and it's like I said, it's sort of Harry Potter, so it's a little bit scary. It's kind of dark. And they learn at this camp basically who they are and to be you beat a witch by being a good person. So that's their weapon is inside of them. So I, I can't wait to read it's, it. It's got a lot of crossover with my little pony and what it's about, the themes and the kind of sincerity of it. And then it's got the military angles. It's perfect for you guys. I know, right? <laughs> awesome. Alright, so you have this experience of writing. Do you have any advice to upcoming writers? Maybe even specifically people who want to get into television and serial writing, stuff like that? Yeah, the television, um, we talked about this at the panel yesterday, and it didn't really occur to me until we were talking about it, but this is true. Excuse me. It's, it's don't, you're not going to get in as a writer immediately. Don't be afraid of being a production assistant, which is an entry-level job, or even an intern, because, unfortunately, it, it is who you know. It's just the way it is. Yeah, but when I was getting into this, and I was like, I'm going to be a writer, I thought people will read what I write and see that it's, a masterpiece and then I'll get all the jobs and that that's not how it works it's it is who you know like any industry right so you start as a PA you start at the bottom and then you let people know. this is what Amy Keating Rogers was saying yesterday she started as a production as a production assistant on Powerpuff Girls and Craig saw a play that she had written Craig McCracken whose show it was so a play she had written and hired her to write on the show so basically so you, get an entry-level job and pound people to read your fan fiction yeah yeah exactly <laughs> okay, my, my career my career path is set. It's all about learning how the whole thing works and then meeting the people there because everybody you meet on that show, whatever show it is, even if you're the lowest on the totem pole, is going to spread out when that show ends onto another show. Okay. So you'll meet all these people and then you'll start getting 
you know, into it, and then you just let people know I want to be a writer, uh, and you'll get a shot. Okay. All right, now when you write, um, do you like to meticulously plan out every single detail in a skeletal outline before you start, or do you more prefer to just kind of stream of consciousness just as it comes to you, write it, and kind of a little more of a freestyle? I used to do that. I used to think outlines and stuff are for suckers, that you you're stifle your creativity. Um, but then I started to see, because I, I was writing mostly TV and films, how important structure is. And in a lot of cases, structure is, is the whole thing. Uh, it's much more important than the actual you know, dialogue or whatever. Uh, and so I'm a massive outliner now. I do okay. huge outlining. I break it all down as far as you can. Because that was the other thing with writer's block. I think part of it was just, I was writing, like the, my book ended up being like 400 pages long. And I was overwhelmed by how much that was. And so you break it down in smaller and smaller pieces that are doable. Today I'm going to write half of this chapter. You know. Right. Um, and if you are outlined and you know exactly where you're going, it's a lot harder to get writer's block. Okay. So I'm a huge believer in knowing where you're going. All right. Now, uh, specifically for My Little Pony, we know there's uh, many different writers and different characters, but each character has their own set uh, character traits and flaws. Is it, what are the challenges of keeping a character consistent over so long with so many different writers? Yeah, that's a really good question. Especially on a show like this, where your whole staff is freelance and we don't really see each other. Oh, really? Yeah. I would, I would have thought they would be sitting in a round room throwing ideas at each other all the time. That happens once per season. Wow. Okay, then. Getting this season, we have a summit. We all get together. We brainstorm all sorts of ideas, as many as you can. Sometimes it lasts two days. And then uh, after that, it's you. And now, it's Megan and me. And she likes to bring in one other writer. So, like, for Magic Duel, uh, the story meeting was me, Cindy Morrow, and Megan breaking down the story and that's it and then I don't see anything again. I deal with Megan over email or Skype. Um, the first convention I went to this one in Chicago is the second time ever that I met Charlotte Fullerton who's a writer in season one and two. I just don't, we don't see each other. Right. So, so, so it's you, really hard. To so you don't have that kind of interaction. How, yeah. how do you manage to keep that, how do you do it? That's what the story editor does is sort of watches for that ah, and okay. makes sure that there's a consistency. Plus we all get all the scripts, so you can read everything. Oh, Even wow. better than that is to watch it. I mean, it takes so long for them to come out, that's not always practical, but when you can hear the voices, then you can really, then you know what's going on. See how someone else had them deliver this line, was yeah. oh, that gives me an idea how to do. Right, or, or like, oh, Pinky wouldn't actually say that, I'm not gonna write that. Okay. You know, it's, it's really reading and watching past stuff, and then kind of relying on the story editor to make sure that consistency is there. Okay. All right. Now uh, we know. I've been told that when it comes to writing songs, you and the other writers will usually write the lyrics and then come up with a simple beat, and you send that to Daniel Ingram, and he builds it. Uh, what is the process of how you create that? I had never done that before the show, oh. so I didn't know anything about it. And I, you can tell by my first song, the lyrics are awful. Which was your the, first song? The one in uh, Cutie Mark Chronicles, Fluttershy's uh -huh. song. The lyrics are so bad. <laughs> Our cameraman's having a little fanboy <laughs> gasm because apparently he loves that song. But it's a great song because yes. it's Daniel Ingram because he made it a great song. The yeah. lyrics are really bad. Some of them don't rhyme and their yeah. tenses change. It's that fun. was going to be my uh, second, my follow up question to that. How many times has Daniel Ingram just completely stunned you? Like, give him something and he comes back with, oh my god. Every, every time. Every, every time. Every single time. Um, the, uh, I was so excited about the Flint Flint Brothers song. That was like my favorite thing I've written on this show because it was it was long and it was a lot was happening and the characters were so fun and other Rainbow Dash would sing here, Granny Smith would sing here. It was just all sorts of stuff going on and I watched it and I was absolutely blown <laughs> out of the water by how good it was and it got stuck in my head and I was happy about that. Um, and the finale. I mean, the finale was interesting because I wrote all those songs and then he took what I wrote, I don't know, I'm not a good lyricist at all. Okay. Uh, he took what I wrote and made it more elegant. Okay. Like the same things happen in the lyrics and some of the lyrics are the same. Like there was a line about frostbite and sunburns that was in my original one and Rarity saying I love weather patterns. Like I did write those lyrics, but he took them and made them kind of pr get, get pretty. molded them. Yeah. And, and so 
he really did write all those songs based off, you know, lyrics that I had written, and they were, they were awesome. I mean, like the, um, what's it called? The big song from that episode. A True True Friend? Yes. That gets in your head. It, yes, it, yes. It does not go away, and, and it's good. If I guys a quick question, this is something I just thought of. Who's decision was it to make the last episode a musical? Was that y'all or was that like kind of mandated? Hasbro didn't have anything to do with that. that was, oh. we, we always wanted to do that um, and we didn't know where to do it and I wanted a two-part finale and we, we didn't get it for whatever reason so it was like, oh boy, we have a lot of stuff to do <laughs> in 22 minutes. And musical so montage. It, well, it made sense to do music because in a musical you can, you, you can do bigger emotions in a song than just through dialogue, right? Which I think you can see in that episode, and then you can also burn through story fast in a musical. In, in a song, you can get through a lot of story a lot faster than you can. Right. right. So it just made sense to do it as a musical. Okay. Um, so pretty pretty early on, I think, in the conception of that episode. Okay. All right. Well, I don't have any more questions planned out. Is there anything else you would like you have for us, or anything else you would like the military brony community to hear from you from the horse's mouth, pony's mouth, or as it would be. I have to say, my biggest part of what makes still work is I love horse puns. I'm addicted to horse puns. So when I hear, when I hear Baltimore and Philadelphia, and <laughs> <laughs> so that's, that's part of the problem though, is like we can't, now that that's out there and people love coming up with them. We can't come up with any original ones anymore because everybody's Because that's right, you, you can't use things that have been we, we, I'm sure we have, and I'm, right. you know, not intentionally, but people have sat down and thought about every location in the world and how can I make this a horse pond. <laughs> so they've all been done now. Well, maybe. No, no, just, no it's just uh, hats off to you guys. I'm a huge military supporter of guys, so uh, keep doing what you're doing and keep watching the show. Hopefully there's not too many people who are so pissed off about the finale that they left. <laughs> no, no. I, I, speaking for myself, what I've seen, the reactions are all positive. We are very stoked, very excited about season four. Especially that little trollish tweet that I think it was Megan put out where it's really a first part yes. of the three parter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That yeah. made us like. She likes to do that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I gotta say, the, the response I saw on Twitter was a lot of, I really hated this idea. I wasn't into this, but I liked it. Yeah. That was the general well, vibe I got. Bronies, we have a tendency to, for some reason to freak out over things because we're so passionate about the show. Right. So, so a change this drastic made us all go. Hey. Yeah, and I totally get that. I hate how the whole thing was handled. I hate all the leaks. I hate all the spoilers. I hate all the preview clips. It makes me crazy. I can't stand that when this episode aired, you pretty much could have figured everything in it out in advance because of all the stuff that was out there. It makes right. me insane. And I would love to have seen a world where the bronies were able to watch the episode and then have a reaction to it based on the episode. So all the nonsense coming out in weeks and actually a year in advance, there's background yeah. images leaked. And, yes. <laughs> ah, this just makes me crazy. So, I don't know what my point was, but there you go. <laughs> the point is, little, little ponies are things. awesome. That's the point. Ponies are awesome. All right, uh, <laughs> uh, Ms. Larson, thank you very much for coming out no and problem. doing this interview for us. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. Thank Thanks, you. guys. And, uh, for any more interviews on all the people on that work with the show, stick it around here, Fob Equestria. And until next time, I'm Tweak uh, from Front to Rear Disappear.